Hello, welcome to my latest video. This one's about a pub rock venue I used to look after called The Cricketers, which was at Kennington Oval, quite near the Elephant and Castle, if you didn't know it. First of all, we're going to have the introduction, and then I'll tell you more after this. So the Cricketers, um, the address was Kennington Oval, London, SE. 11. You could walk to the middle of London in about 20 minutes from the front door. So it's very easy to get to, which was why possibly it was so successful in getting good acts to play there. Because um, A&R men, who are people who book acts for record at companies, would be able to get there very easily. Because uh, most of them were based in the West End of London, Soho and around there. And... Um, you could basically get a taxi or get a tube across there in 10 minutes. So I arrived there, first of all, in about 1984. Gordon Hunt was the lead guitarist with a band called Socks, I think they were called. He was a raster man. He had raster hair. He, I think he first booked Gina Washington, the Ram Jam band off me in, in the early 80s. And basically my friend Joe Pearson, who booked acts for the Half Moon Putney occasion, who was a teacher really, became a headmaster, now runs Design for Life, a very good small publishing company. But at the time, he was a teacher and a booking ex for the Half Moon Putney. And he um, was asked by the landlord, Kenny, to book the acts for the cricketers. This is about 84, 85, I think. Um, and he asked me, because he knew I was like um, free and easy. I was an agent at the time, so I had my evenings free. And he asked me whether I wanted to go and do the door for him at the cricketers. So I did. Eventually, I managed to wangle my way into it so that I was booking the bands and not Joe. This was partly me being a bit naughty, but partly because he, because he was a teacher and doing all sorts of other things, didn't really have time to do the job properly. But I did, of course, and I was really into the idea, and it's a great venue, very small, only held 200 people. I think legally, we weren't supposed to get more than 150 in it. We got in at 200, and that was like quite full, but not overly awful. Very occasionally, I would get more than that in, because frankly, if lots of people turn up, um, and basically, it was just one bar, one bar, and it only opened in the, the evenings for the music. So if you want to go in, you really had to pay to get in, because obviously the bands got paid by how, how people pay to go in on the door. So normally I would put on bands like um, Steve Marriott, who I already mentioned in another post, Gino Washington, Wilco Johnson. There were so many at the time, I can't remember them all. Um, we basically ran seven days a week and it's Sunday lunchtime. Sunday lunchtime was free to get in and that was where they made a lot of their money. That Well, the landlord did, I didn't, obviously. Here are just a few of the acts that have played at the cricketers. Well, actually, most of them, because I um, racked my brains and there was one note of one I missed out, I noticed, after I'd done this. This was done for another video that I did early on about my life in the music business. So if you want to watch that, there's a link up there somewhere. Right, and here it is. To each one a kiss I'm falling for the shadows in the deep And I've caught the quiet I couldn't do a video about the cricketers without mentioning Ronnie the barman, who was a total character. Um, he was a really, really funny guy. He's no longer with us. I was corresponding with his um, son and his ex-wife recently, and apparently he passed away about 10 years ago in Liverpool. He was a proud Liverpoolian. Um, and he basically was the life and soul of the cricketers. He was a funny guy in all um, aspects of the word. 
He used to have little party pieces he used to do. He was very erratic. I think it's fair to say that nobody really knew what he was thinking most of the of the time. Um, for example, he used to go up to people. One of his tricks was when he's serving a drink. Now, bear in mind that there's normally a band playing at this stage, or at least DJ. So there's, there's quite a lot of noise. So he would go, he would be at the pump putting a pint and, and there'd be perhaps one of the regulars there and he'd say to him, um, you are a complete blah, blah, blah. I, I, I won't say the actual word because it's a very rude word. You are complete. Everybody thinks so. Nobody likes you. And the person, you would watch their faces like drop as they listen to this. And he'd do this all, all the time. Then afterwards, he'd just go, ah, ha, 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 only joking. And then he'd turn away smiling. Right, the thing is, though, half the time he wasn't joking. And that's what, how he used to tell people what he thought of them. It wasn't always that. He used to say things, I don't know, he used to tell people things that... Um, Maybe they didn't want to hear. And he was just a humorous guy. He had this friend called Moody. And on a Saturday afternoon, they used to go out dressed up in their, in their finery and um, con their way into the director's boxes at whichever football club they were going to go. And they used to actually be... They used to talk their way in and get all the free booze and all the free drink. And they used to do this every Saturday. I don't know how they managed it and they used to turn up back at the pub at about six it's lot <coughs> and they'd be really drunk and they'd be drinking champagne all afternoon in the director's box and all that and it was um and they had a few stories and they'd be mixing with all the top people in um the uh, football game now i'm not really into f uh, football so most of what they told me was actually lost on me but there's some fantastic stories about people like george best and people like that and um that's it. So that is actually Ronnie. He was a real character and and he was one of the backbones of the cricketers. And he'll be sorely missed. In fact, the table I'm sitting next to, I'm working on, he sold me that. Amongst lots of things that he actually sold me over the years, he sold me a fantastic coat, which which lasted till about 10 years ago, which is an overcoat that lasts about 30 years. It's pretty good, isn't it? And he told me his table, which is still working. And um, there you go, that's Ronnie. And um, the first thing I did when I got there was bands used to have to bring in their own PA. Now, Gordon used to book a lot of jazz bands. So that involved them turning up with a very small PA system, which is what they have, the microphones and the speakers, and a very small PA system, which they could switch on and get going in about half an hour. But the bigger bands, which I started to book, had to bring in proper big PA. So it meant that every day, Somebody had to get there at five o'clock and then load in the PA and then do a big sound check and then they do the gig. And afterwards they take the whole PA out again. It just takes so much time. So eventually I got to my friend Paul at the Wembley Loudspeaker Company who put in a PA. I think I was doing an HP thing with him when I was paying for him for it. So I was basically paying by the week and then at the end of a certain period, I think it was like two years or whatever, I would own it. This is the technical side of it. The booking side of it was um, I eventually started to live at the pub. Ian Dury used to live quite close in Oval Mansions, which was three or four doors down, which was a squat. And that was like a very trendy arty squat, and we used to know people there. But they, for some reason, didn't like paying to get into the pub. They thought it was like, but art should be free, because the big problem that is that people want to get paid. So I started booking bigger and bigger bands, I think one of the biggest we had was the Pogues, who at the time were quite big, and I used to be quite involved with the Pogues. In fact, I asked them if I could manage them, and we were quite close to working that out, I think. They were with a guy called Stan Brennan, who ran a record shop in Soho, but I think I was getting quite close to getting a deal. But then a guy called Frank Murray turned up, who was a very good manager, much better than me, and so they, I basically put them on in their first big, larger gigs. I think we did upstairs at the Clarendon, we did a few other things like that. And so to sever the ties with me, because they then went off to, we got an agent and Frank, you know, organised all the stuff. They did a week for me at, at the Cricketers and I think I was just paying them a very peppercorn rent, just paying them like, I don't know, a few hundred pounds and I would keep the rest as my payoff, if you see what I mean. That was good and that helped get more acts in because of course the agents in, at that time, there were lots of pubs and venues in London and pubs had a certain 
name that some bands didn't like playing in pubs. Like, for example, a lot of the trendier bands wouldn't wouldn't play there because it was a pub. So I'd have to like go out and explain to it that it was only open in the evenings. It was it was not like a normal pub where people would come in and play dominoes and things. So eventually, we got like bigger and bigger bands. We got like a lot of people who would be touring bands. I got a good relationship with Rough Trade Records and Rough Trade Agency, and so we got a lot of acts off them, like a lot of bands from Australia. So we had a lot of good acts, and and um, then I would get a lot of country acts in from Texas, Flacco, Jimenez, and people like that, and then Johnny Jones, a friend of mine, worked with Fairport Convention, and so we had a bit of a crossover there. So actually we built it up. So what happened was, it was going really well, and then in 1990, Margaret Thatcher, who was the Prime Minister at the time, decided that the breweries who basically owned pubs, that they could sell their beer through, that was the whole reason for it, and it made a lot of sense, but she decided for some reason they had too much power. So she decided that breweries couldn't own so many pubs. They only own like, hundreds I think it was so eventually all these all the people who work for the breweries just started their own pub company without the financial incentive of having to sell wanting to sell their beer so it didn't really work because then they were only interested in the how much the property was worth so it all messed up anyway the firm that took over our pub was called Entrepreneur it used to be Grand Metropolitan Watney's Truman's and that was a lot better but then the same people started this property property company in effect and they decided the rent had double and obviously and obviously Kenny couldn't afford to pay it because he's only he was doing okay but he wasn't doing anything spectacular because as I say we only opened during the evenings and the Sunday lunch times and then if there was a test match on at the Oval Cricket Ground they'd be open all day for that and then they'd throw it out and then they would reopen again for the evening for the band so that was the only time really that was only one say year and the odd international they had there that um, it was worth the thing. So it wasn't worth his while to pay extra. So, so eventually we left on the 30th of September 1990 and it was taken over by a bunch of bikers, believe it or not, called the Road Rats, who totally messed it all up. They came in, painted the whole place black, threw out all the artwork we had in there and all the paintings and all the original stuff and just painted it black. And um, eventually it, it all failed because obviously people didn't like going there. The bikers, they were like, you know, so it's like um, sons of anarchy now and taking over a pub. So a lot of people felt um, threatened by them. So people just stopped going there. But by that time I was working at Time Out, so I wasn't that worried about it. The guy who took over came to see me and he um, asked me to, well, I, I could help him book the band. So I didn't actually take over. I just pointed him in the right direction and they paid me a certain amount of money for helping them. And then the money dried up because obviously no one was going there. And then eventually they, it's no secret that they actually tried to burn the place down and claim on the insurance with a PA company in there because a friend of mine was asked to put in a dodgy PA which is just the boxes and not the stuff inside it so how much would it cost to put a load of boxes in there look like a PA thing and then somebody threw a um, petrol bomb through the window which was them and unfortunately they didn't really work it out not very bright so, so, it, so it went in the window and then did right angles to land on the stage and burn all the PA so it's just not thought out at all and then anyway, they went and then um, I think a Jamaican policeman moved in next and he got into trouble for selling vegetarian, somebody who was a vegetarian ate patties which had meat in it because he said it was vegetarian. He didn't do that well. He, he thought he was buying up a slice of, of cricket in history but not realising that the test match was only once a year there and no one ever went outside the ground when it was like a small county match so he went and gone and then he became a, a Portuguese restaurant and I hear they were paying a pound a year rent or something because it was doing so badly and then eventually it was boarded up and it's still boarded up now to this day so that was the end of the cricketers bit of a shame because it was one of the even though it's not in any of the history books, because um, history tends to be written by people who are in charge of history. Like, for example, there's a book by Will Birch. It's a very good book about pub rock, but it basically looks at it from the angle of stiff records and stops when stiff records are like stops. So the pub rock era did carry on after that, after all the Hope and Anchor and the Red Cow and the Nashville era. It was places like the Cricketers, the Bull and Gate, the Robin, Finsbury Park. So this was like the second wave of pub rock, or maybe the third wave, I don't know. And the Cricketers was very much part of that, even though now it's hardly mentioned. So that's my little bit of 
slice of history about the cricketers. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please like it down below. If you didn't like it, well, um, I always say that, don't I? I must get very annoying. Please comment down below. Let me know what you think. Did you ever go to the cricketers when it's in its heyday? Did you enjoy it? Did you go when the bikers were there? <gasps> did you? Did you? Subscribe. You haven't subscribed. If you have, thank you. If you haven't, please subscribe and press the bell icon for notifications. And I hope to see you next time with more rock and roll memorabilia or more stuff that takes my fancy. Next time might be about how to cook rice. That's how esoteric it's all going to get. So hope you enjoyed it all. See you later.